Richard Bali is going to discuss uh, the book uh, of uh, um, Dimitri Helmur, Savoir et Duvernay, and uh, Gail Fine, Gail Fine uh, The Possibility of Anger. Um, Richard Bali is Professor Emeritus uh, at Annie Scott College in Georgia. Uh, he is the author of Plato's Craft of Justice. Uh, uh, and uh, of, mm, many articles uh, I would like to uh, uh, mention here um, Psychological Dimension of Edinkons in the Gorgias, uh, published in the Review Archai in Brasil, and uh, an uh, um, essay very, very, very good for me, very interesting. Uh, about the Timaeus, the intelligible world animal in Plato's Timaeus, published in the Journal of the History of Philosophy. Richard. Thank you, Franco. Um, I can't help but feel that I have an almost impossible task here. I'm supposed to give you a taste of these books, and I hope to tempt you to read them. But then, of course, as the book reviewer, I've got to say something that's critical. So, um, Dimitriel Muir's Savoir et Duvernay is a thoroughgoing commentary on the statesman slash politicus. First, a word about the scholarly background. As the footnotes show, the author typically relies on French and English commentary on the dialogue. As a consequence, the book addresses the dialogue from both of these rich traditions. Are you getting a ring? Besides covering so much secondary literature, and not just the two languages, the book, con uh, the book considers the text exhaustively. The upshot is that the book obtains the level of a standard commentary that others who write on this dialogue will have to consult. Before I turn to particular issues in the book, let me say something about the dialogue itself. It is not an easy dialogue to love. Ostensibly about ruling, it often fits between the other two dialogues in the topic. Very close? I thought it makes it worse. Okay. Ostensibly about ruling, it ought to fit between two other dialogues on the topic, the Republic and the Laws. And since one of the important differences between these two is the centrality of the rule of law, one looks to the treatment of that theme in the statesman for insight. However, while the dialogue does address the topic, it does so in such a problematic way as to seem to leave the reader with little that is useful. Sorry, sorry. In fact, the whole dialogue seems written to frustrate. The, the, the stranger embeds his investigation in long passages about dialectic, whose relation to the topic of statesmanship is at best unclear. Some commentators, for instance, have decided that the dialogue is really an ex exercise in dialectic only, and in this dialogue, dialectic is understood to be collection and division. Since the stranger only uses this, according to this line, the statesman as an illustration of dialectic, the results on, this, on the topic of statesmanship are negligible and not to be taken seriously. However, some recent attempts have been made to rehabilitate the dialogue, so to speak. In the stranger's knowledge, statesmanship, philosophy, and law, and play the statesman, Javier Marquez attempts to weave the whole dialogue together into a coherent whole. El Muir's book is in the same vein. In particular, he argues at length that the dialectical sections and the definition of the statesman are integral to one another. He has set himself a tall order. 
However, given time restraints, I am not going to talk about the way the book integrates the dialectical aspects of the dialogue with the definition of statesman. Su suffice it to say that the book exhibits a good deal of close reading of the text, some of it quite convincing, and some of it a little less so. Instead, I will focus on two major arguments in the book, both dealing with the very possibility of human self-government. First is the well-known myth. After the stranger's first dialectical exercise ends with the embarrassing definition of humans as featherless bipeds, of which the statesman is the herder, he abruptly changes the direction of the investigation by invoking a myth as a way forward. It is a cosmic myth that combines three elements from the fund of legends. First, the divinely caused reversal of the heavenly revolution. Second, the birth of humans from the earth. And third, the ages of Kronos and of Zeus. In the traditional reading, there are two cosmic cycles, the age of Zeus and the age of Kronos. We exist in the former with what we consider to be the standard direction of the revolution of the heavens. This era is marked by sexual reproduction of humans, as well as the gods' abandonment from the cosmos. In the age of Kronos, the heavens revolve in the direction opposite to the age of Zeus. Humans arise from the earth fully formed, and the whole cosmos is under the direct rule of the gods. While recent commentary has cast doubt on this reading, though Muir stays in his traditional reading, but then he has to face up to one of his philosophically problematic consequences. Commentators widely agree that human government and politics are possible only in the age of Zeus when the gods do not exercise direct rule over humans. This divine abandonment is an extremely important feature of the myth because it affords humans the autonomy necessary for government and politics. The paradox is that only when humans are left to their own limited and fallible design devices are they capable of ruling themselves. It would appear, then, that humans can rule themselves only in circumstances in which they are quite likely to fail. The traditional reading confirms this gloomy assessment because it holds that divine abandonment results in increasing chaos in the whole cosmos. In fact, what we might call the revisionist reading of the myth avoids this sort of divine abandonment, thus making room for the possibility of successful human government, governance. At this point, however, though Muir tries to soften the traditional reading when he claims that the failure of politics more, is more our fault than that of the cosmos. Ainsi, on nous décrivons l'univers comme son grand and révélateur de monde dans le chaos, Platon ne décrira pas quant à nature du monde qui est le nôtre que ce que la politique telle qu'elle est actuellement exercée est le nôtre monde. The conclusion seems to leave open the possibility of successful human government. Whether this response is compatible with the traditional reading of the myth, we will leave aside in order to look at another feature of the possibility of government and politics that is, as it is presented in this dialogue. In chapter 8, El Muir approaches one of the more intriguing issues in the statesman, the relation between extant constitutions, monarchy, aristocracy, and democracy, and the real constitution. The latter is the only one in which the ruler has the knowledge of ruling. Without the expert, none of the others is genuine. Nevertheless, the stranger claims that some of these can imitate the real constitution by adhering to their written laws. At this point, the dialogue arrives at the crucial issue, the conflict between rule by an expert and rule by, of law. It is hard not to see the stranger as attempting to achieve some equilibrium on the topic. His argument has the dialectical form. First, the best constitution is ruled by the expert, although he might well use laws, but only as subordinate to his knowledge. However, under the false constitution, the rule of law can be disastrous, as the stranger argues in his striking account of the way the uncomprehending city would suppress independence and even existence of the usual expertise. This account, of course, is an allegory for the way in which a city would protect itself from rule by an expert in ruling. 
still, this situation is better than arbitrary rule by an ignorant and corrupt ruler. Next, we learn that in a city which adopts laws on the basis of experience and advice, strictly adhering to the laws is much better than overturning the laws. Finally, the stranger argues, in the absence of an expert, the correct imitation of the best constitution is to follow its laws. The challenge is to make this passage coherent. El Muir adheres to the reading of this passage according to which imitation of the ideal implies strictly following and not changing the established law. However, it follows that the law-abiding constitutions must sacrifice whatever advantage changing the laws might entail in favor of the value of stability. La stabilité de la cité vaut mieux que n'importe quel changement, même en vue d'une amélioration, si elle est motivée par ignorance. If this rather severe judgment captures the stranger's argument at this point, it implies that human self-government and politics are possible, but only if they are rigidly conservative. This consequence follows because El Muir's conditional, si elle est motivée par ignorance, is fulfilled in cities as they are actually constituted. They are always motivated by ignorance, if ignorance means the absence of a statesman's knowledge. This result is momentous because it would mark a shift in Plato's thought, one that anticipates the laws where the rule of law is the form of government. The stranger then has led the conversation to a point where the possibility of human government, governance is, has been at least admitted but again in fairly pessimistic terms. The rule of law, as fraught as it is, is not only possible, it is necessary because cities, as they are now constituted, will not abide rule by expert statesmen. So we might surmise that human government, governance has found a precarious space between divine and expert rule on the one hand and total chaos on the other. However, El Muir argues that rule by an expert statesman, statesman is still possible even in the actual world. Focusing in on the passage which ends with the strangers conceding that if such an expert would arise, he would be loved and governed happily. Notice the conditionals in that sentence. El Muir argues that this concession, along with the dialogue long, long tortured with statesmen, implies that rule by an expert could happen. En ce sens, il me semble que le politique tout entier est une entreprise destinée à transformer l'idée même du roi unique et se faisant à rendre possible son un éventuelle réalisation que Platon ne juge pas inaccessible. While an attractive proposal, it does not seem to escape the dialectical toils of this section of the dialogue. But that's as, as much as I have to say about uh, El Muir's book. Uh, well, I admire it greatly, and I commend it to you. I hope you will read it. My second task here is to talk about Gail Fine's uh, book published in 2014, The Possibility of Inquiry. <laughs> the title refers to a problem whose origins are found in the Mino. In fact, it is called Mino's Paradox. Quoting, uh, but how will you inquire into this, Socrates, when you don't at all know what it is? Or what sort of thing from among the things you don't know will you put forward as the thing you are inquiring into? And if you really encounter it, how will you know that this is a thing you don't know? When Socrates rephrases Mino's paradox, it becomes a dilemma. He says, I understand the sort of thing you want to say, Mino. You see what a heuristic argument you're introducing? That it's not possible for someone to inquire either into that which he knows or into that which he does not know, for he wouldn't inquire into the, that which he knows, for he knows it and there's no need for a such a person to inquire, nor into that which he doesn't know, or he doesn't even know what he'll inquire into. Inquiry is impossible on this dilemma, either because one knows or one does not know. 
As we know, Socrates' answer to the dilemma is the theory of recollection. Now, this paradox and the dilemma and the theory of recollection has been the focus of a lot of uh, analytic investigation. It is, after all, the sort of puzzle that looks as though it could be solved if we could achieve clarity about the terms involved, knowledge of X, inquiry about X, what sorts of things X stands for, and finally, what recollection really means. Certainly, Fine has written a book that uses her considerable analytic skills to sort through a generous selection of recent, especially English language commentary, all of it offering ways to understand the terms in the whole argument, the dilemma and its context. She seems to aim at something like a definitive sorting out of concepts, terms, and logic so that we can at last understand what we know as original paradox. Socrates' restatement of it and its solution to it. That task takes the first half of the book. Then she turns to the not played end of the paradox in Aristotle and the Peripatetics, the Epicureans, the Stoics, and the Skeptics. In these remarks, I have time only to deal with the first half of the, of the book and only with the, a few points of the analysis there. Fine focuses on Socrates' restatement of Mino's original paradox, which transforms it into a dilemma. <coughs> Excuse me. She argues that Socrates does not believe that the, uh, Socrates believes that the dilemma is valid. It's certainly, the way she sets it up, it looks valid. But Socrates does not believe the dilemma is sound. So there is one premise: Socrates does not believe true. In particular, he thinks that uh, the claim, if one does not know X, one cannot inquire into X, is false. <clears throat> Thus, according to her, Socrates holds that we do not need knowledge of X in order to inquire about X. Now, this claim about inquiry is different from another claim that Socrates also makes, one about knowledge. Socrates also says that one cannot know whether virtue is teachable without knowing what virtue is, without knowing the essence of virtue, according to her. Nevertheless, according to Fine, inquiry into, inquiry into X does not require knowledge of the essence of X. In fact, she argues that in his conversation with the slave boy, Socrates shows that inquiry is possible, starting only with true belief. For instance, the slave boy does not know the essence of a square, although he has the true belief that a square has four equal sides. Refined by Lenkus, such preliminary true beliefs lead to secure belief, which then is the basis for what ultimately will be knowledge. So, at this point, we can't really answer to the question whether the inquiry about X is possible when one does not know X. Since the slave boy has conducted a successful inquiry without knowledge, the answer to the question is yes. Then Fine turns, that is, you can inquire without having knowledge ahead of time. Then Fine turns to her second task, which is, um, well, Socrates says that recollection explains how inquiry is possible. But he is not forthcoming about how recollection does make inquiry possible. Fine thinks the explanation is implicit in the text. Here she offers an interpretation of the notion of recollection that goes counter to what others have said about recollection as an explanation for inquiry. I would like to focus my remaining remarks on her interpretation of um, uh, how recollection functions as an explanation for inquiry. To understand her interpretation, we have to start with what she holds as a wrong interpretation. Many have argued that recollection explains the possibility of inquiry because one recollects innate knowledge. In this view, the slave boy will come to know the solution to the geometrical problem because he already knows it innately, and by elinquus, he will recover what he knows innately. In this kind of account, somewhere in his soul, the slave boy knows the solution, but only latently, it needs to be made explicit. Fine, however, argues that Socrates' notion of recollection in the Mino, at least, 
does not apply this sort of recovery of latent knowledge. According to Fine, Socratic recollection is based on prenatal knowledge that has been forgotten. One might ask how latent innate knowledge differs from forgotten prenatal knowledge. Certainly I did. After all, if recollection is the recovery of forgotten prenatal knowledge, then it seems indistinguishable from the recovery of latent innate knowledge. In both cases, one recovers knowledge, in one case forgotten knowledge, and in the other latent knowledge. To understand her distinction between the two, <coughs> latent innate and prenatal, we need to use three forms of innate knowledge, which we have to understand the three forms of innate knowledge she lays out. So, put on your seatbelts for going through rough weather here. First is the innate, first is the innate cognitive, cognitive condition. The second is innate content. The third is innate disposition. It is best to start with, to understand, with innate content, which is a proposition or maybe a noetic object somewhere in one's soul at birth. However, one is not necessarily born knowing or grasping the content, or the free-floating content out there. In innate cognitive condition, more one is born knowing some content or other. The concept of innate cognitive condition, however, is complicated by the fact that it can be either explicit or latent. That is, one might be born consciously knowing some content, or one might be born knowing some content, but only in an unconscious way. In any event, we can understand recollection using either, in the statement that I quoted fine, either of the, using either the notion of content or the notion of cognitive condition. Thus, one might recollect some innate content and then come to know it. Alternately, one might recollect a latent cognitive condition if one previously knew only latent some content. All right. Finally, innate disposition does not have a content. It is a disposition that one is born with that enables one to acquire knowledge using true or relevant beliefs. At this point, Fine argues that prenatal knowledge implies at best only that the slave boy has an innate disposition to acquire knowledge. He does not have the knowledge in the form of some content or other or in the form of a latent cognitive condition. Rather, he starts with true beliefs or at least relevant beliefs, correct relevant beliefs, that are subject to relinquish. His ability to arrive by these means at knowledge is explained by an innate disposition to use true beliefs to arrive at knowledge. However, having the disposition does not imply that one must arrive at knowledge, only that one can. Thus, her account of the way recollection makes inquiry possible is deflationary. Recollection is the way innate disposition uses true beliefs to arrive at knowledge. In fact, her account is even more deflationary since she says that Socrates does not actually posit innate, an innate disposition. So finally, according to her, either his argument depends implicitly on taking recollection to imply such a disposition, or he has no way of explaining how recollection explains inquiry. While there are many places in this account where one might disagree with Fine's reading of the text, I will leave them aside. I dwell only on the problem of prenatal knowledge and its relation to recollection. We have seen that she denies recollection implies innate knowledge, at least in the cognitive condition and content senses. But she argues that it does imply prenatal knowledge. Prenatal knowledge is knowledge that one once had but has now forgotten and no longer has. Although she does not explicitly say so, Fine talks as though prenatal knowledge has a specific content. Then if recollection recovers this prenatal knowledge, it recovers this content. Then prenatal knowledge is indistinguishable from latent innate knowledge in keeping the cognitive condition sense or the content sense, contrary to what she has said. However, if recollection doesn't recover prenatal knowledge, what does it recover? 
And if it doesn't recover prenatal knowledge, well, I'm going to deposit prenatal knowledge. <laughs> Another way to put this problem is to say that recollection implies recovering something. If it is not recovering content or cognitive condition, I imagine uh, Fine is forced to say that in recollection, one recovers an innate disposition, but not one tied to any specific content. But then we arrive at the same result. Since recollection is not tied to prenatal knowledge, why posit it at all? The upshot, I believe, is that Fine's deflationary account of recollection leaves us no way to understand why Socrates would have suggested recollection is a solution to Mino's paradox, or at any rate, his reformulation of it. Uh, as I'm reading this, I realize it sounds much, uh, it sounds very severe, it is very severe, but I don't wish that, uh, I don't want that to imply that you shouldn't read this book because it's an extraordinary analysis of a difficult text and, and, and it's not going to, it's well worth reading. Thank you. 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 Thank you.